Welcome back, Ed. Good to see you again, man. Thank you for having me back. Well, I'm I'm happy you're back, but I'm not happy that there was a motivation to bring you back based on the violence. You know, the violence that is going on between uh, the cartels and it was the Mormons, and then there was we were just talking about this uh, other person that got shot because they ran. What would you, would you explain that again? They ran a cartel roadblock. Yeah, basically in Tamaulipas, a lot of the cartel groups actually make uh, they build their roadblocks in the on the state and, and local roads. And according to what I've heard from some of the people that I know there, uh, this family uh, ran one of those roadblocks. They didn't know if it was cops or not, and they apparently decided to run the roadblock, and they, the cartel guys shot them. What should someone do if they encounter a cartel roadblock? Uh, slow down. Um, I mean, if... if uh, if anything, I would probably avoid traveling through those areas. That's the number one yeah. avoidance. Um, usually, you know, and I've actually gone through some of those myself. Really? Yeah. And it's uh, it's all about they're all they're all, they're looking out for the for rivals moving through their territory. They're looking for government personnel, maybe spying on them. And uh, usually, it in, usually they'll just shake you down for some money and they'll uh, let you go on your way. Unless you have a four by four truck that can use for their, you know, their own purposes, which is oh, what, they might take your truck. Yeah, uh, uh, specifically in Tamaulipas, four by four trucks are a commodity for them. They use them for their ongoing you know, turf war. Oh right, especially someone else's. They don't mind getting shot up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, most of the trucks that you see any, that are arm, up armored or they have the rifles on top are usually stolen vehicles. Um, all of them are stolen vehicles, and a lot of them are, you know, Americans crossing into Mexico. Some of them are Amer Americans crossing into Mexico and just getting you know, the truck stolen. Jesus yeah. Christ, is that that's a real common thing? It's 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 starting to be pretty common. Um, uh, I recently saw a case of an of a, an apparent abduction uh, in uh, in in Tamaulipas. Um, you see the video, and 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 the cartel guys come out of the car. They grab the 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 owner of a of a pickup truck. They get him out of the car. They take his cell phone, leave it on the sidewalk because they're they're aware of all the SOS technology, and they take him inside in, inside of another car, and they take the truck. And you thought you, know, you would think you know it's it's because he did something or he's he's, he's involved in something. They let him go a few blocks later and just took the truck. It was all about the truck. Wow. Yeah, it's resources. You know, they're just acquiring resources for their for the war, basically. Nice of them to let him go. Nice of them to let him go. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's not always the case. It's not always the case, but it's pretty, yeah. I think most people in America are just now waking up to the chaos that's going on down there. I think that uh, the Mormon assassination was a real wake-up call, but I think uh, people are paying much more attention now. I mean, we we talked about this. When was the last time you were on? It was like five months? Yeah. Something like that? A, a lot of the stuff we talked about those five months ago, uh, kind of, that's how things progressed. We actually yeah. did mention the Mormon communities yeah. down there, which was kind of eerie. Yeah. And... Uh, I, I, we talked about the possible designation of, of cartels as terrorist uh, ter uh, uh, terror groups. Yeah, you you had an interesting take on that. So uh, Trump was saying that they were going to designate them as terrorist groups and that they were going to have military action against them. Yeah. And then there was some sort of negotiation with the president of Mexico. Like, what, do you, what do you think went down there? So, I mean, this is just, you know, from what I see and from how things traditionally happen down there. Mexico is currently uh, has a current currently a, a leftist president down there. He's very to the left, uh, so much to the left that he uh, he recently gave Evo Morales, the deposed leftist uh, president of uh, uh, Bolivia, uh, asylum in the country. Um, and there's been a lot of you know pro left political stuff going on in Mexico, basically. Um, as soon as the designation threat by the U.S. came down, there was uh, some sort of negotiation, and a lot of things happened after after some U.S. officials went down there and talked to the government. Among them, Evo Morales is out. He's uh, He went to Cuba, apparently, and then went to uh, Argentina, so he's not going to stay in Mexico. Mm. Uh, former head of, uh, of uh, public security under the Calderon administration, which is two administrations past, the President Calderon is the one that started the drug war. He was uh, arrested for cartel involvement and uh, basically for seeing money from the cartels. I That's, saw that, yeah. yeah. 
Um, he was going through his immigration process and he was actually asking for full citizenship and they got him on lying through the authority, the immigration authorities. He said that he'd never received money from the cartels and apparently he did a lot of it, right? So all these things happened after, after they walked back the threat of, uh, of uh, designating cartels as a terrorist organization. Right? So there has been some action. So they yeah. must have made some negotiation where Trump had said, listen, we're going to do this. And he said, hold up. Let's let's talk. Yeah, let's, I mean, a, a main thing is, a mo uh, one of the things that this uh, current president uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador ran on was uh, creating a national police force, right? A, a, a national guard is, is what he calls it, which had already kind of been done before, but you know, change the name, change the uniform, change the packaging, and it's a new thing, right? Uh, he wa he wanted the army out of the drug war because the casualties uh, were mounting on both sides, and he said it wasn't a military, uh, uh, shouldn't be a military operation. And he ran on a platform that was called Abrazos No Balazos, which means hugs, not bullets, right? So oh, basically, Jesus Christ. Amnesty for the cartels was basically kind of the main theme of that. Um, so he got into power. The first thing he did, militarized police forces and created a National Guard. And dissolve and try to dissolve the federal police, uh, and most of that uh, national guard uh, force was uh, designated to border patrol duties on the Mexican side. So some of them went to the south of the border, um, uh, south southern Mexican border, and some of them went to the northern Mexican border, basically to stem the whole illegal uh, immigration crisis with the caravans. That's what kind of happened, and it was a kind of a. a a collaboration between the U.S. and the Mexican government. Um, so that was one of the key points of collaboration that they had. And when this whole designation thing went up, that was kind of like a bargaining chip that the Mexican government had with the U.S. And the rest of the things that kind of transpired afterwards, you know, it's pretty interesting how a lot of things happened after that uh, meeting down there uh, and how they walked back the, uh, the terrorist designation. So the terrorist, de terrorist designation would mean that Trump would have some sort of incentive to invade Mexico. Well, it, it would, it would, it, it would open up the possibility for military direct military action against strikes, yeah, drone, drone strikes, strikes without yeah. permission of the, of the nation that yeah. these stri uh, strikes were going to take place. Also targeting finances, uh, or anything related to cartel activities would be targeted. Well, yeah, where do the cartels keep their cash? <laughs> well, um, it, it's 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 a, it's right now it's a myriad of things. Um, they diversified long ago, so it's not like they're keeping uh, buried cash in a in, in a container container somewhere in the in the jungle like Escobar used to do, right? Right. They're still finding some some like rotted cash from the eighties. They're they're putting their money in cryptocurrency. Uh, they're, they're, really? They're, yeah, they're diversifying their uh, their their uh, investments in actual companies, like legit companies, so they're cleaning their money that way. Um, real estate, hotels, uh, property on the U.S. side, so they're also investing on the U.S. side of the border as well. So you know, money's it's it's not you know it's not under the mattress or you know giant stacks of cash in a room but somewhere. What what kind of banks do business with the cartels? Like well, how do they negotiate I'm, that? I'm not going to say names, but there's no. been a few cases of pretty large banks that have been involved in in, in uh, money laundering for the cartels recently, and people can look that up easily. Mm. But you would think you would have a designate cartel. Uh, you would have cartels designated as terrorists. So now there are banks involved in funding terrorism. <sighs> So that would change things. That's you know, there's a lot of things that would happen. You know, some some of these consequences. You know, people talk about yeah, designate him as a terrorist and send drones down there. Things that they kind of don't talk about is that if a terrorist designation does happen, uh, most people seeking asylum in the U.S. from Mexico now have the claim of uh, of running from terrorists in in Mexico. So oh. so they can. So now they can claim that as far as a, a you know asylum seeking people can claim that now. It's a different thing. Um, you know, the, the main argument that a lot of people say is that cartels aren't, uh, can't be considered a terrorist, uh, terrorist group because they don't have political aspirations. The problem with that theory is that we have a lot of political killings by cartels in Mexico where they shoot the candidate of one side of the political spectrum because it's not good for them. So they influence politics. They also pay off a lot of politicians down there. Um, and they also... Uh, examples of the new generation cartel from Guadalajara giving out uh, Christmas gifts or 
groceries to the poor, basically doing hearts and minds type tactics in the area are clear political movements, right? Yeah. So, you know. How does it, ter- why does terrorism have to be connected to politics? Well, that's, that's that seems- classical, the classical definition of that is, uh, of a terrorist group, that's what they're basing it on. I think the cartels and, 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 and narco-terrorism is a thing in and of itself. It's a new phenomenon. It should be, terrorism should be reclassified to include it, I think. You know, most people that live through that type of situation in that type of, in, in that type of area in the country uh, facing some of these cartel threats that have fled it, we'll call it what it is. Yeah. It's, it's terrorism. Terrorism. They're terrified. Yeah. I mean, that's literally, I mean, who's more terrifying than the cartels? Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... What's going on with the Mormons now is are they moving out of there now? Are they going to go back to Utah and just take one wife? Like <laughs> that's what it all started out with, right? Yeah, well, all the fundamentalist group and they they went down there and kind of proceeded with their customs. Um, I'm in contact with with a few of the members of that family, and you know, I was in contact before, but when I went on here, they kind of like one of them reached out like, hey. Mm. What's going on? Say, Help hey, us well, out. <laughs> what do we need to do? Yeah. Um, but then, you know, it was like a friendly hello from them from past interactions. And then this happened. And, you know, I kind of advised a little bit, but that's, you know, that it's, it's a mess. Um, a, lot of them, a lot of them are leaving the communities down there. There's a lot of them down there, a lot of communities uh, in Sonora, Coahuila, uh, and, um, you know, they're leaving. They're leaving the area. It's just too dangerous. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it only makes sense. Uh, I mean, they just don't have the arms. They don't have the, 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 the tactics, the, manpower. The, uh, and, and they're also in the middle of one of the most important regions in Mexico right now um, for a lot of reasons. Main thing, is, uh, there's two things that are really, really kind of happening in that region. One, the traffic, uh, the trafficking of fentanyl and heroin and all these drugs through one of the main drug routes up into the U.S., and there's a few factions fighting over that uh, region, Los Salazar, which are a small cartel faction that has allegiances to Sinaloa cartel. And the Linea cartel, which has historically been in control of uh, Ciudad Juarez. So they're both kind of buying for control of the area. Uh, a few hours before the, the, the massacre actually took place, there were a bunch of firefights between these two factions in the area. So one of the main theories is that these uh, the, this group of uh, Mormons basically were case of mistaken identity, kind of driving into some of the areas where they're being protected by some of these people. You know, it's one theory, right? Um, the other thing that people kind of need to think about is that the largest mineable uh, mineable deposits of lithium on the planet right now are a few hours away from where that massacre took place. Really. Yes, and that is, you know, I'm not conspiracy theory, or theorizing here, but it's a pretty important thing in that region. And there's a lot of interest in that space and control for that space. And they're not mining it currently? There's pro- there's a bunch of projects in play right now. Um, oh, so they've identified the deposits. Uh, yeah, you know, people can look up the numbers, but it's it's the largest mineable deposit of lithium on the planet. Whoa. And, and there was some sort of deal uh, in the past where a Canadian mining agency was going to have rights to it, and the mining agency was bought by the Ch- by a Chinese company. So, again, after that massacre, a lot of things happened. A lot of the negotiations happened. That pro- that deal was one of the things that got killed after that situation. Oh no! All right. So it's 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 an interesting area. There's a yeah. lot of things happening there. That's got to put a tremendous amount of pressure on the cartels in some way, right? Well, uh, historically, any sort of uh, any sort of mining operation usually has industry around it, which is perfect for the cartels. You know, um, uh, extortion, protection rackets, um, f- uh, feeding the the uh, drug use in the area from the workers. You know, that's. Is there any way that you could see in the future the cartels being extracted? from the positions of power that they're in now. I mean, or is this something that people in Mexico are going to have to live with forever? And I guess people in the United States as well. Or is this something that could be fixed? Um, you, you, you've, uh, you've, you've talked about before in some of your podcasts, and I, you know, I listen to them a lot. It's a great podcast. Thank my you. favorite. Great um, one you're on, too. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but you talked about legalization and how that would help. That definitely is part of the solution. And it is. It is definitely part of the, the solution, legalizing some drugs. You know, not all drugs are made the same. Maybe not fentanyl, you know, but yeah. 
but that would help out some things. Um, there's uh, there's multiple things that could be done to to guide us towards a place where things could stabilize down there. And a lot of it is not going to be able to be done in Mexico. It's going to have to be done up here, right? Um, basically, you know, one, you, you have to take care of, the U.S. has to take care of the drug market up here, the illegal drug market. And certain things that have happened, like legalization of marijuana and marijuana in some, some places up here, have changed the dynamics of what happens down there. Some for the better, some for some bad. Some bad things have happened. Um, talking to uh, my friend John Norris, who was on here mm-hmm. as well, and uh, comparing notes, seeing how a lot of the drug growths that are up here, the pot, illegal pot growths that are up here, are exactly like the ones that I found in Baja six, seven years ago, and how some of that drug money made from those fields are is staying in, in the U.S. It's not being sent back. So that means you have an active, growing cartel presence in the U.S. That is U.S. based. So I think the, the, one of the, the problems that people have is perception is that that's a Mexican problem. It's a it's a U.S. Mexico problem. You know, you, you have a border there, but the problem has two root causes, right? Social, economic inequality, and destabilization and corrupt government down there, and a thriving illegal drug market up here, and. You know, those two have to be solved just set, I mean, to, in, a, in, a, in a combined way. How many members, when you combine all the cartels, how many members are we talking about? That's, I mean, it's pretty hard to put a number on how, m- I will say this. More than a million? I will say this. They defeated the Mexican army in Sinaloa. Yeah, that was bananas. Yeah. When they captured El Chapo's son. Yeah. And then the army gave it back. Yeah, they're like, yeah, you can have them back. Well, sorry, uh, the, the that whole situation, uh, and it was like I, I remember that was happening, and I was getting asked questions about it, and it was live. It was all yeah. of, all of a sudden just popped off, you know. Um, basically, a, supposedly, official story from the Mexican government is that they send a special police unit to capture him, right? Which is completely false i think because you don't send 35 agents to capture one of the the heads of one of the biggest Sinaloa law cartel cells right so it's pretty much uh by chance they spotted this party people were armed there they went there all of a sudden well chapo's son is there so you think they just stumbled into him there's a i, I posted a video on my, on my feed of the capture of, of the of, of uh, el chapo's son you can see it and you can see the surprise and really how the agents are kind of uncomfortable or are fearful of what they just stumble in on. Um, imagine U.S. agents stumbling on one of the um, America's most wanted individuals up here. They're going to put him on the ground. They're going to handcuff him. Mm-hmm. In the video, you can see that they point their rifles at him, and he calmly takes out his gun and hands it to somebody inside of the, inside of the house he was in and walks out and kind of tries to negotiate with the people outside, the federal agents that are trying to arrest him. And you can see that the agents are like, oh, what did we stumble in on? Oh. Right? So that happened. They grabbed them. They reported back to Mexico. They captured him. They started to announce the capture. And his brother, um, uh, his half-brother, Archibaldo, basically called in all of the reinforcements from all surrounding towns and regions in Sinaloa. And it was flooded with a bunch of armed cartel guys. All of Sinaloa was. Wasn't there a video of the government people and the cartel people talking? Yeah, there's, oh. there, there's, it's on my feed. Um, yeah. you, can, you can see it if you want. It's, a, it's basically a, an army unit that was being sent to reinforce security in, in Culiacan, being surrounded by cartel members. Yeah, is this it right here? Yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, obviously, the guys running around with a vest and wearing skinny jeans are some of the Sinaloa cartel members. Yeah. <sighs> um, <laughs> and they just talk it through. I mean, uh, they're outnumbered, and also there's uh, there's talk about uh, there's a there's a specific community out there in Sinaloa where all the f- uh, army families uh, members live, and they were apparently being held hostage by cartel guys as a bar- bargaining chip. So, so all these guys that we're seeing here, they're dressed in civilian clothes with the vest. Those are all cartel guys. Those are all cartel guys. Jesus Christ! And that th- and that they're shaking th- hands with everybody. Well, you know, hey, what's up, homie? <laughs> I mean, uh, they, the, 
again, we go back into the whole what what is uh, the fight they have in them, right? Mm-hmm. The Sinaloa Law Cartel was basically surrounding some of their communities and holding, holding their family members hostage. So that went out over the radio. So as an army member going in to fight the cartel, so you know what? I'm out of this fight. Yeah. So they raise their hands. So. And so then they release the hostages. Everybody backs out. Yeah. I mean, there's they, they defeated the Mexican government, basically. Um, a- anything they went up against, you know. Um, they surrounded the city. Usually you'll see... Classic, uh, classic uh, Mexican cartel uh, uh, activity. They close off the streets going into the city by burning uh, semis and trailers and stuff like that. So you would see all these burning semi trailers in the region. So if you want to move in, you can't. And if you want to use your helicopters, the cartels have anti-aircraft capabilities. So uh, they broke out a bunch of people from the prison, just taking advantage of the whole chaos. Uh, you, you, you could see there's a few other videos where there, there's uh, armored trucks with uh, 50 cows and maduses on the back of them just moving around the city. So there's no way. There's no way you can. Uh, this is the breakout state prison. You know, took advantage of the whole chaos and just, you know, let, just let, uh, let's break some of our friends out. Yeah. All right. So just pure chaos. Uh, eventually, they let the, the government decided to let them go. That's the, the official story. But according to the people there, there was no government saying let him go. There was like the guys holding him and said, you know what, it's not worth it. Yeah, that's one of the uh, the uh, technicals, as they call them up here. <sighs> yeah, dump trucks, they armor plate the sides and you know, put somebody out. God, should... imagine being a person living there. Well, that's, just, that's, that's what I'm trying to picture, like yeah. what life is like for the civilians. And yeah, most of these videos are all done you now by civilians so yeah. there, there's a certain normalcy in some of these cases especially in Tina law it's part of it it's, it's part of the uh, culture there and as far as sides go you know hey the army's coming to save us that's not usually what te- pe- some people in some of these communities think you know because the cartels are those are the guys in charge. So has Sinaloa always been like that? Like how long has it Sinaloa been? Sinaloa has traditionally been, been a, a cradle for like the origins of some of the hot, some of the more successful cartel uh, heads, right? Isn't that where Julio Cesar Chavez is from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he is. Yeah. And, um, you know, lot, lots of uh, lots of anybody that's anybody in Sinaloa has some sort of relationship to the cartels because they're part of culture there. There's, wow. there's no way getting around it had a surreal experience once when I went there. I did a class out there. Um, and the uh, was running down this bumpy road. And then all of a sudden, just flat, beautiful road. Oh, yeah, this is the cartel part of the road that they built. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, wow. So it's like sort of like the mob in Vegas in, the, in like the 50s yeah, and 60s. Exact, exactly. But it's now in there. Way more hardcore. Way more hardcore. You know, yeah. Some, some of their grave, uh, gra- they have a... Uh, Jardines del Maya is called is, is the uh, narco cemetery they have, and it's basically luxury condos. They look like I mean, I went there. I thought it was a church, and it turned out to be a tomb. Wow! Right. So the the opulence and the money there is just overt, you know. And and how they move around, they roll around in vehicles with guns, and nobody does anything because they own the city. What can be? What are they planning on doing? Does anybody have any plans, or is it just they're just accepting this? Well, you know, you 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 get a lot of rhetoric about uh, collaboration. Yeah, that's that's Jardines de Maya. All of those are graves. Some of them wow. have CCTV video inside, air conditioning, you know, alarms. Those yeah. are graves. Those are grave sites, and the cartel guys' uh, heads go there. Wow. And on the Day of the Dead, have music, live bands, shoot their rakes into the air. Nobody does anything. Wow. <coughs> Jesus Christ, this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, the opulence is amazing. I mean, uh, to just seeing it, you know, it's, a, it's like having several Escobars in one place. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's like a lot of, car- a lot of uh, cartels' uh, heads are from that region, and a lot of their kids grew up in that, and, you know, the opulence is amazing. Fuck. Like, is this going to grow? I think it is. I, it's, I mean, I don't think it is. It is growing. You know, again, uh, going back to my friend John Norris and having, seeing his experiences up here, uh, finding all these illegal drug grows in, 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 in public lands, it's growing. It's growing over here, too. Yeah. So you Roots. S- yeah. So um, 
think a thing that a lot of people have to think about. A lot of these cartel guys had their kids up here. So they, they made their money down there and they sent their wives up here. And a lot of these kids that were born in the late eighties, early nineties, coming of age up here with that cartel pedigree. So and they're US citizens, US passport. <sighs> So you're, you're gonna you're gonna see some sort of shift, and you know they're coming of age. You'll get experience. You get you know a handoff of reins from the older generation to the newer generation. And you're gonna see you're definitely it's definitely growing. It seems so crazy to watch because it, it seems like it's not discussed nearly enough, and it it seems like if it, if it keeps getting stronger, like w- what we saw with El Chapo's son being released. Like what? It, what's to stop it from taking over Mexico entirely? Well, I mean, you you, you would have people arguing that it already has in, in different ways. So, I think another thing that people kind of have to kind of figure out and realize is that there's factions in Mexican in the Mexican government. So you will see a federal government that apparently is being paid off by a very specific large cartel group, and then you'll see state governments that are a different political uh, party influenced. Uh, paying off by other cartel uh, groups. So you'll see, you know, military units moving on the town and the state police blocking their way to get in there because they play for different teams, right? Whoa. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of talk right now about uh, Felipe Calderon's tenure and how his head of, secu- uh, head of public safety was on the payroll of the Sinaloa cartel, which actually came out uh, during El Chapo's trial. So now you're talking about basically a federal police force that was on El Chapo's side. So he had free reigns to grow and do whatever he had to do in that region with the support of the federal government in a way. So te- <laughs> technically, you know, who's in control of some regions? And, and realistically, some regions of Mexico are completely in cartel control. Now, we discussed this on the last podcast, but let's give people a, a little just a recap of this just so people can understand your position when you first started working on for the with the the mexican government with this it wasn't like it is now uh, it was it, so well, it, give I, give everybody just a, a rundown uh, of how it went down so i i went to i went to work for for uh state government uh down in mexico in baja specifically and, uh, and this was in this was 2004 right Right before the start of the official start of the kickoff of the drug war, as as, as the kickoff, the kickoff. <laughs> uh, but there was, you know, the, the official start was when Felipe Calderon came into office and said, "You know what? Gloves off. We're gonna go after the organized crime. Right? We're gonna send the military into into this onto the streets, and they're gonna head up spearhead uh, operations against the cartels." But before that things were happening still. You know, uh, Sinaloa cartel was growing. Uh, there was a rift between the Sinaloa cartel and Tijuana cartel. Uh, fragmentation. He- cartel heads were being killed and one cartel turned to the three. You know, all this fragmentation. And then, you know, they, they basically militarized the war on drugs with Calderon. Came in, militarized the war on drugs. Immediately you start seeing that drug uh, drug enforcement efforts were being put towards a single or a group of cartel groups, but not the but not a major one like Sinaloa cartel. So you start seeing how they were basically taking sides. They were breaking up the competition. That's what you would gather from and you making know, it look like progress. Yeah, yeah. and and, oh, and also, uh, El Chapo has been built up into this mythical figure, like he was the head of the Sinaloa cartel. He's the main guy. That's not true at all. He was an operator for the Sinaloa cartel, but not the main operator. You know, there's different theories and 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 uh, about who is actually who was actually in charge or the brain behind the whole operation. When you say Sinaloa cartel, it's not one group. It's several. Uh, it's a federation of several criminal groups, enterprises uniting. And working in conjunction to put drugs into the into the United States. Well, one of the things they do is put drugs into the United States. They do a lot of things, but that's one of the things they do. So, you know, p- certain people, c- c- there's a lot of people out there that theorize that El Mayo Zambada, which is El Chapo's compadre, who's still out there, is the actual head of the Sinaloa cartel and has been since the start. Uh, but you see how some of these people become celebrities. And as soon as somebody becomes a celebrity like El Chapo, who escaped from you know custody a, f- a few times, you know under you know pretty interesting situations. I mean, it's pretty interesting uh, uh, situations. 
uh, now the government has a celebrity they can go after so they can point at that guy. That guy's, mm. a, that guy's a bad guy, right? So you saw a lot of that, a lot of theatri uh, theatrics around him as far as him being the head of whatever you know group or operation was. But at the same time, you start seeing you know the DEA and and the and the U.S. government uh, uh, condecorating and and putting all these awards on a guy like Luna, who was the guy that got arrested recently, who was head of security down in Mexico. And now all of a sudden he's no no he's not you know he was recognized by the U.S. government as being a player for like, the good guys, and now he's arrested. So you start seeing all these you know different interests, different political. Uh, political kind of m m movements around the drug war and what that turned into, and uh, you know you know what you don't know what to think, right? Each and each also each U.S. administration has changed the way they do things when it comes to the drug war, and it also benefits certain groups down there. So you know who knows? Realistically, fuck. Yeah, it's just you know I, I went to Chichen Itza I think in two thousand ish. 2002 maybe 2003 somewhere around the, that time and there was no concern yeah yeah it's it's, it's a different time you know? that's but that's 16 know. 17 years yeah. ago that's so recent in terms of like human history yeah that a region changes so radically so quickly well it's 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 it, there's a lot of things happening you know um there's a lot of interest china has a lot of interest in mexico and um you go back and you see some things like the. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, you see things like the um, the whole um, how some uh, armed groups started popping up uh, uh, in Mexico in the Michoacan area, fighting back against the cartels. The uh, the whole there was like a, a series, uh, like a documentary on them. The the, the uh, auto defensas they were they were called basically like vigilante groups. And then you, later on, you realize that they were all fighting for basically protecting or in, uh, or working around security for illegal Chinese or mining in the area. Whoa! Yeah, it, it's all, it was all about uh, Chinese ore mining, uh, iron ore mining, illegal Chinese ore mi so mining. So the Chinese the ore miners, they just made a deal. Yeah, and then you know let's, we can get in on it. So let's arm all these guys, and we're we're, we're protecting our communities. But there were, you know, there was a lot of shit. that going on. Not all of them, but a lot. Of, there was a lot of shady stuff going on in the region when it comes to that. Now you see things like the stuff that's going on in Sonora, and there's a lot of lithium there. That's a pretty valuable thing, you know. Yeah. Sonora is a place that a lot of hunters go. Yeah. Sonora has these big hunting ranches and it's like it's famous for giant mule deer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's I, I've been up out there hunting myself and it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful part of Mexico. But that seems like a sketchy spot to but it's, be it's venturing it's, into. It's, it's perfect because it's uh it's perfect for them because it's rural so there's yeah. nobody around. Uh But if you were like a guy from Texas wanting to drive your truck down there do a little hunting. I mean, my, my recommendation is this: if you have a four by four, don't don't take it down there. Take you know? a, a fucking Yugo. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have the largest population of American citizens living outside of the country in Mexico for some reason. So, really? Yeah. In all throughout Mexico? Yeah, I mean all throughout Mexico. Well, there's, it's there's fun down there. Well, th a lot of people like Cabo. People love Mexican food. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's there's there is there is a certain chaotic freedom in Mexico, which I'll you know. I, being some a child of Mexico and then moving up here and seeing you guys talk about freedom, you're not, you're not, not that free. <laughs> you know? But but there's there's I, I get the I get the draw, you know. And some of these communities down there are pretty safe, uh, but some aren't, you know. Uh, they're safe until they're not safe. And safe until they the, until they all of a sudden you're in the middle of a some place that's going to be disputed, which is I think is something along the lines of what happened to some of these Mormon communities down there. Mm. You know, you're on, you're you're in the middle. Your community and your movements are in the middle of our route. Could you please get out of the way? What's the ceiling on this? Like, if if they can can continue to grow, I mean, it's it's really is it possible that we're looking at a country that might be completely run and <coughs> overrun by criminal organizations and drug sellers? Some parts of it are already. Yeah. So you, what I think is going to happen is you'll, you'll see escalations. Uh, a clear sign or a clear group that is like a like a, a sign of things to come is the uh, is the new generation cartel. 
The new generation cartel is a cartel that was uh, it used to be called Los Matasetas. It was basically a, a, an armed enforcing group that Sinaloa cartel made to go after their main rivals, the Setas, which were originally members of special Mexican special forces that said, you know what, we're going to be cartel guys uh, now and cartel enforcers now. So they whole sorted history. Um, these uh, it, it was a militarized group that was form, formed to go after them, right? And their whole kind of play was that we're going to be against extortion, against abducting people, against affecting the community. We're going to enforce the law in our communities, but we're also going to move drugs through here, right? But that, <sighs> you know, that's kind of their thing. So you see this uh, group start kind of growing in the region. And right now it's pretty big. It's rivaling the Sinaloa cartel as far as power and, and, and reach. Uh, but the way they do their things is militarized. It's very militaristic and kind of paramilitary, and, and it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, of the like the uh, the FARC groups in Colombia. Uh, hearts and minds. They go into the communities, the community policing in the area. Uh, they originally said, you know, we're aware the government wants to fight drugs here in the region. We agree with their fight, but we are also going to fight against these guys that are affecting the community as well. And they have like groups of people. They have uh, they have training camps, militaristic training camps, where they recruit people. They take them there, and they're being trained in, in guerrilla warfare and shooting. And apparently, there's some SF guys from the U.S. that that advise them. So that's the, that's the next thing. The ex the the, the escalation of a simple ragtag group of cartel guys enforcing a region to an actual cohesive paramilitary group now trying to vie for control not just of the of the drug routes but also of the populace and the confidence that the populace has in them so it could turn political at some point right <sighs> it just seems like it's the genie's out of the bottle it is i mean it is i mean it is in a lot of ways you know um and going after it just as a you know drug enforcement issue is not you know it's, it's it's, it's so a, much bigger than that. Yeah, it's uh, cultural. It's uh, economic. You know, some of these kids I, I posted up. Some of these uh, cartel soldier kids are twelve years old. Gold-plated uh, guns. Gold-plated guns. You know, uh, they don't have an op- they don't have options in their lives. Right. It's, it's that or nothing. Right. So, it's either awesome life or yeah. short awesome extreme life. poverty. Short awesome life. Yeah. Or short poverty. awesome life or extreme poverty. So yeah. that's one component to it. Another component is systemic corruption as a society from who knows when, you know, it's always been a thing in Mexico. People that grew up down there, you get stopped at a, a red light and you're like, uh, can I pay the fine here? You know, people that are yeah. from down there will be aware of this. Yeah, show you the, show the paperwork, you slide that thing in there, you know. That's, you know, that's part of the culture. That's affecting a lot of things as well. You know, people don't pay attention to the small rules, so the big rules don't matter, right? Uh, and just being next to the largest drug market on the planet, you know, and having money, firearms, uh, rounds going down, and fentanyl that is being fabricated in Mexico now, and some of the Chinese fentanyl making its way through into the U.S., kind of filling the voids that some of the uh, the drug market has right now. So they're making fentanyl laced, fake fentanyl laced pills that are gonna that are being put into the U.S. and fentanyl fentanyl laced heroin, right? So that's where they're going towards now. That's why you see this epidemic up here. And a lot of things traditionally kind of focused on uh, pot before it was legalized in a lot of regions up here. Now is heroin and fentanyl. So it's actually kind of accelerated the production of the more harmful and dangerous drugs. In in some ways, yes. I mean, they had to find another. You know, it, it was it it, it went pot, uh, meth, and now fentanyl laced heroin or fentanyl laced pills. See, in the problem with the idea of uh, legalization is that if you try to be the person who says, hey, folks, we need to legalize drugs here in America because we've got this problem with the cartels, politically, that's suicide. Yeah. No, no one, I mean, even though it's probably right. It is. I think it is. I think it is very right. It's one of those things that's so counterintuitive that most people are going to go, you're crazy. You're going to make my kids hooked on drugs. Well, uh, well I'll say this. I, I was, I, I fought in the drug war. I literally a drug war veteran. Yes. And if I had a white flag, I would hand it over to you. You know, it's like, I, that is, it's a useless fight. I, I got to destroy pot fields. Realistically thinking about all the effort and all the blood. I'm like, it's just pot. Yeah, and it's, it's so quick to grow back. 
I mean, it, that, it, yeah. it, it, is, it is a fruitless fight. Fentanyl, uh, heroin, maybe different drugs. Uh, yeah, fentanyl in particular. Is... Uh, but a lot of that fentanyl is coming from China. Mm-hmm. It's not a Mexican yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the people that are making uh, or pr- producing fentanyl in places like Mexico are from China, setting up laboratories in Mexico. So, <sighs> so it's, a, it's a Chinese, Mexican, U.S. problem as well. God damn. What can be done? Other than the legalization, what can be done? I mean, how does, in, unless the United States literally goes to war with the Mexican cartels, and you you made a face talking I, about that. I, I mean, I, I'd say designation is one of. One, I, I think designation should. It's it's going to happen. A terrorist designation. It's going to happen. I mean, again, we just saw the murder, the massacre of Mexican. They were uh, dual citizenship. Uh, nine people, kids, women. It's not uncommon for that to happen to Mexican nationals. It's pretty uncommon for that to happen to American nationals down there, and that woke up woke up a bunch of people, you know. Mm-hmm. And now we another recent murder of another um, American national, you know, kid with his parents down there. You know, people will say, but "Just don't go down to Mexico." But 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 some of these people, you know, live down there, have family down there, have communities down there. Um, it's just ultra violent. Uh, you know, people have to wake up on this side to realize this problem is not going to get any better. This problem is not just a Mexican problem. It's a U.S.-Mexican problem. And, uh, you know, it'll get to a point where it's going to be, you know, I, I think in my lifetime there's going to be some sort of armed inter- intervention in Mexico at some point. Really? So you anticipate almost like in a civil war? I, I think something's going to happen in Mexico that's going to destabilize it so much that the U.S. won't have another option but to put boots on the ground, probably. That's, I think that's, that's where we're headed. The problem, and again, another of, the, another of the problems is that the government is part of the problem. So you can go down there and negotiate with this government, but six years later, it's going to be another government. You got to renegotiate with them. Yeah, and also you with you, new palm grease. Yeah, and then you put all your faith in the military, and the military gets compromised. You put all the faith in the, in the uh, Mexican Marines, and then they get compromised. And now who do you, who do you have? Right. So, it's systemic. Don't tell that to Trump. <clears throat> he'll, use, he'll use that as an excuse. We can't count on them. We're going in. I um, I mean, I wonder. <coughs> Where it all goes, because it, it is obviously growing very fast. It's obviously huge and incredibly powerful. Yeah, and, and, and it affects, I mean, I, I'm, I'm up here now, and I could see the effects of it up here. Uh, walking through L.A., seeing all the needles on the ground, um, uh, going to Seattle, seeing the same light brown fentanyl-laced fentanyl heroin that I saw in shanty towns down in Baja. It's like, wow, so this is where it kind of ends up. Right. Yeah, so you you and you see the effects of it throughout. So you know you 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 realize quickly as somebody from both sides that I am, you realize that there realistically there's no bo- there's kind of no border when it comes to this problem. You know, this pro- this 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 problem doesn't respect a border wall. Right. Right. Uh, submarines will go around it. Tunnels will go under it. Drones will fly over it. Uh, and it's a it's a, it's a problem that just keeps you know producing an effect. And I think the majority of the United States citizens are completely unaware of the complexity and the depth of the problem. Yeah, I mean, it it, it is. Well, it, it's and it's also. I think most people seeing the Iran thing right now, most people know more about that. Oh that's yeah, going off, going on halfway across the world. Yeah, than what's going on. Just you know, a few hours. That's what's time. crazy to me. It's like, you know, we're we're into invading countries that are really barely affecting us. They're like a seventeen-hour plane flight. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the uh, I don't know. Again, I don't I don't want to be Ed Adamas and you know predict stuff. Ed Adamas. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the the fact that we have a lot of lithium in Sonora is going to be a factor for a reason can, to clean it up. It should be. You know? Should be. It's pretty important. It's a pretty important resource. Yeah, but if they can't hold on to El Chapo's son, how uh, the f- 
that's that's why I think uh, U.S. Gonna, is going to have to you know put foots on the boots on the ground down there. Wow. Now, if you had to make a bet, like if there's a betting line in Vegas, like how many how many days or how many years from now will there be American soldiers deployed to Mexico? I don't know. I, I'd say five years, maybe. Whoa. Within five years. Really? I mean, cur- we we are on. We just passed this. This past year has been the most violent year in Mexico in recorded history. Really? And it's the first year of administration of this new president, right, who's been trying to... Hugs. Hugs, uh, hugs, not not bullets. Abrazos, no balazos, you know, this instead of that. Uh, his, it's been his first year, and, you know, hey, give him a chance. He's he's, he's, he's doing whatever he it's needs to do. It's only the most violent year in history. Yeah. Cut the guy a break. Exactly. That's what they say. But then I go down there, and I have a lot of... A lot of my friends that are still down there, people that I've trained uh, still down there, and I hear from them directly. Like I have some uh, young kids that are in the Gendarmeria, which is like a federal police force that uh, patrols all of Mexico. And some of the federal federal police guys, they tell me like, Ed, we're, we, they, they, they said, or you signed the new contract to be the Guardia Nacional and lower your pay and all of, your, all of the stuff that all of your benefits will be gone. Or you just stay on here in limbo and just stay at the base, and a lot of them are staying at the base. So it's nothing, nothing's, nothing's, nothing's being done. Basically. Well, I imagine that if it seems overwhelming and it seems helpless and it seems like the cartels are just taking over and they're making a shitload of money, and you're not making any money. I mean that that is the real crazy thing about <coughs> it, right? There, if the the government is asking people in this sort of already compromised situation and environment asking them to work for a small amount of money to go after people that are making a tremendous amount of money yeah and you're going to be at war with these people and these people they're basically your neighbors yeah and also you go there with a federal uniform as part of the federal government you go into a community where you the federal government doesn't do anything for them right the church is made by the cartels cartel made the road christmas was brought brought to you by the cartels you know um they they are the good guys. So these guys come in here like, who are these guys? Like, what are they doing here? We're not gonna. So that's you know, it's 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 it is, it's 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 a mess. It's a mess. Wow. But could boots on the ground actually fix anything? I mean, I'm not a I don't, I'm not a I'm not a military expert, uh, but uh, there has to be some sort of outside force that is completely uncompromised by cartel. Uh, money and influence. How and, long before they compromise those people? Well, uh, when you put the Marines on the border, uh, a few of them got picked up on smuggling people uh, from the border. So, yeah, that's knows? what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, who knows? <laughs> you know? just, just, uh, it, it's it, it's a, and it's also it, it's a different war field because a lot of you know a lot of our war fighters and law enforcement are have some sort of blood ties to Mexico. Mm. Of course. Well, not only that, I was just watching some uh, (laughs) video where there was this guy who uh, is a U.S. veteran, been deployed overseas, fought for this country, and his mom was getting deported. And he said he felt betrayed. Like, here here he is in America. His his mother brought him over here, had him over here. He's a U.S. citizen. And they're deporting his mom. As if his mom is a a danger or a problem. There's a community of, of Army, Marine, and several veterans that are deported veterans that live in in places like Tijuana. That's fucking crazy. Uh, that is know, fucking crazy. DUI. You fight for the country, man. You get it, a DOI and you're... But how nuts is that? It is pretty nuts. It's fucking ridiculous. Uh, you fight for this country. You you literally risk your life. And there's assholes out there that haven't done a goddamn thing and been mooching off the system forever and they're citizens and you're yeah. not? Yeah. I, I mean, my perspective and my life life path, you know, when I came up here, I want I want to earn it, right? I don't know. I came up here motivated, want to do a difference, work, uh, and apparently, you know, I've, I've had I've, I've had some you know static in my in my endeavors. Uh, my kid was born in the U.S. and uh, parented her mom's American, right? When I went to uh, to the hospital to pay for uh, the 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 uh, insurance uh, part of it, they laughed at me and said, "You shouldn't pay any of this. You're Mexican. You just can claim benefits." Right, that, that that was in California. So that was like, oh, but I I can afford it. No, you should just, just you should, there's ways around this, you know. 
And that's when I knew, you know, there's America and there's California America, right? California America is different? Yeah, California America is very different. It's a subtle blend? Oh, I mean, there's there's ways around stuff, you know, there's free stuff, you know, get it, get it, <laughs> get at it, you know? You know it's, 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 it's a weird, you know, again, I, I travel across the country, just get to experience different parts of, uh, of the U.S. You know, I, I spent New Year's in Kentucky, and that's pretty interesting. Yeehaw. Part. Oh, it's. I mean, I like it. You know, maybe I mean, it's like a. It's like a white Mexico. Is it? Yeah. How so? Uh, people were shooting guns into the air on New Year's <laughs> Eve. That's pretty Mexican. You know. <laughs> they do that in Texas too. Oh well, you know. Again, you know. I don't know. It's it's a, it's, it's not good. Some lady got shot. Oh, it's completely she was irresponsible. Standing in her driveway, a grandma completely with her family, and the bullet fell out of the sky and hit her in the chest. Yeah. Uh, when we when New Year would come, we would park underneath the the bridges. In, in Baja to not get, you know, there's uh, <laughs> firearms are legal in Mexico. And then, you know, you see tracing, tracer rounds just going oh off. Oh my the God. You're like tracer rounds. <laughs> okay. You know, <sighs> it's, it's, it's again, Mexico is a weird place. You know, that's why I call it the upside down. You know, um, you know, there's, the, the, there's, there's a chaotic freedom to Mexico, which I get. I mean, I love my, I, I love Mexico as a country, as a culture. I don't like the government, though. <laughs> the government is just, you know, at all levels. It's just, you know, it's not a good... Well, it seems like it's always been that way. I'm reading this book about Kit Carson and the, the Old West and when the United States, you know, conquered parts of California and, and took over parts of California and, and the West from Mexico. And it was crazy back then. Yeah, yeah. And they were, they were talking about the, the chaos in, in the Mexican government and the Mexican military back then in the 1800s. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, uh, so so people kind of figure it, uh, realize uh, if, 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 if you want to be an officer in the, in the Mexican army, uh, you have to go through war college. And there's different ways to go about it. But you, there's a lot of hereditary stuff going on. There. Hereditary. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, my dad was your general. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know. There's, there's a lot of that going on. Also, the the army down there has a monopoly over selling guns. It's only one gun store in all of Mexico, and it's run by the the army. What? Yep, one gun store in all in all of Mexico, and it's run by the army. And you have to fly to Mexico City to to get a license and to procure a firearm. So, legally. if you live in the Yucatan, you have to fly to Mexico. You got to fly to Mexico City to get a gun, which makes which basically makes the only uh, options buying a gun on the black market. Or, f- or flying over there and expending all this money, so there's a now it's a class. So only only people that can afford the plane ticket and to do all this process are the ones that can have guns. So it's a that's class, you know, classes involved in there as well. What kind of rights do you have with guns versus the United States Second Amendment? Is it somewhere? Uh, so the Constitution, the Mexican Constitution, allows for guns for self defense, but a lot of amendments and a lot of corrupt governments down there said maybe not a good idea to have this here. So progressively throughout Mexican recent Mexican history, it's become more and more strict, right? Certain rounds aren't allowed, uh, certain calibers aren't allowed, and this, the, the, just plainly the sale of firearms in all of Mexico is just relegated to a single uh, gun store in Mexico City. Whew. So you can't carry them without a, without a permit, and to get a permit you have to know somebody that knows the presidente or a general or something. It's well, what hard. about all those gentlemen we saw in that video just walking in front of those government agents with with guns? Why the, didn't they arrest them? They should have. They should have. You know, Seems like those uh, yeah. well, lawbreakers. The, the only people that are, that respect those uh, laws are you know law-abiding citizens. There was a case in uh, <sighs> Veracruz of an old man, a former army uh, guy, old older gentleman. Uh, he tr- his son tried to get abducted, some, something like that. He had this old Mauser rifle, and he shot dead one of the guys that was chasing him. He was trying to ad- abduct him. He was arrested for the, the, the firearm possession. And, and Mauser the, is what Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly used on JFK. Yeah. That's an old-ass gun. Well, there's a lot of weird old-ass stuff down there. You, we, I, I mean, as far as the stuff that gets handed over or just the weird exotic firearms down there, a, a, a lot of people call Mexico the U.S.'s garage. And like the like garages, you just find weird stuff down there from old World War II era pistols and explosives to uh, new stuff. Like there's a, a friend of mine uh, that works for the government down there told me that they found a bunch of uh, – parts for a minigun 
in a in a house somewhere down there. What's a minigun? It's basically a remember that uh, go ahead, remember that uh, Terminator Two movie? Yeah. That thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty one hard to get. Yeah, one of those. Uh, apparently, there's one out there somewhere uh, on a vehicle of some sort. Oh Jesus! It's basically a it'll obliterate everything. Well, we talked about the Ed Holder Fast and Fur- <coughs> Furious deal last time that you were here, and that to me still is one of the most bizarre cases in in the history of an undercover operation that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, they sold guns. Like they, literally sold working guns to a specific cartel down there to and try to tr- was it, so they could track them or I don't remember what kind of yeah. bullshit argument that but, was. But it, the 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 interesting part, or if you want to go into the you know the questions that that they benefited a single cartel, the Sinaloa cartel. That's the uh, that's the thing. You know, that's most of the guns went well, to that. If you had a guess, if you were a conspiracy theorist, like put on your tinfoil hat, what do you think that was all about? Uh, they were probably. As a as a, as a nation, you were probably want, wanting to only worry about a single threat as far as cartels, and not a lot of cartels. So they empowered one cartel. Yeah, really. So, I, I mean, we're, that was coming off the uh, Patriot Act era, Bush era thing. I remember vividly people putting Geiger counters in some of the drug tunnels that we would find. So they were worried about nukes getting put into drug tunnels at at some point during during that whole post 9-11 era. So it would make sense that if you are uh, worried about national security, you would want to not worry about a lot of cartels, maybe focus on one, support one, and just keep us in the know. Do you think this was a covert operation in the sense of that the Sinaloa cartel was not aware that they were doing this to empower them, to eliminate the competition, to strengthen one group because they just knew it was inevitable that someone there's takes a lot, control? There's a lot of people that are now coming out after the, the whole uh, – there's a lot of things that were said at the uh, Chapo trial that are – that would lead somebody to believe that there was some sort of official support from the U.S. government to the Sinaloa cartel as far as them – having deals with these this cartel specifically to keep things to keep them in the know about things happening down there uh, supporting them to be that be in a position so they can keep control over their region and basically as an information group so they can have have a clear eye and ear in a chaotic area like Mexico on the bad guy side that's what I that's why I gather from it Jesus Christ but that kind of uh, it's it's al- it's almost like <coughs> They feel like it's helpless. Like they have to do something like that. That they have to do that because there's no way to fix it. So what you got to do is kind of try to manage it or move it in certain directions. Well, there's there's there's, there's all like every now, every now and then I post some stuff up uh, about that uh, type of situation, and everybody goes to well, the CIA has been running drugs into the U.S. for years and, and using planes and stuff like that. There is there are. Uh, instances of CIA involvement and in different stuff down in Mexico that you know are, are pretty obvious now from the 80s and the, and the 90s, uh, as far as supporting certain groups or just trying to keep tabs on these people. But you know, I think we're coming to a point in our history where a lot of these people are dead, a lot of these people are in jail, a lot of these people got book deals, and a lot <laughs> of these people are talking. And you're, you, I mean, it's interesting seeing some of the stuff that is coming out now that in my time when I was active would have gotten you in a hole probably somewhere if you talked about it. Oh. So there was definitely, I mean, I, 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 my mind was blown when I was seeing El Chapo on Netflix because a lot of stuff that was going on in that show is fictionalized stuff that I went through myself. So I was like, this is on Netflix now. How accurate was it? Some pretty good, accurate parts. So there's a there's a character in that show called. Uh, Sol- we're talking about narco's, and we're no. talking about the Mexican version yeah. of narco's, right? Because there was uh, there, a Colombian a, first. Yeah, there there's a ver- narco's is pretty good. There's a there's a El Chapo series on Netflix as well. Oh, there is. Yeah, it's in Spanish. It's pretty popular, but it's pretty accurate. There's a guy in the in the in does the it show. have subtitles? It does. Oh. Uh, there's a guy in the show. Uh, Conrado Sol is his name. Which would, nobody, which people were trying to figure out who that was, is basically a government uh, guy that had a deal with El Chapo, and they both kind of escalated in power. It turns out it was Luna, right? So this show was showing him the character 
uh, El Sol, which depicts Luna as a corrupt politician that was working security, work, working both sides, and all of a sudden, you, you know, recently, a few months, a few weeks back, they arrested the guy. Wow! You know? So the show was kind of predicting. Do you, <laughs> do you think that the show had anything to do with him being arrested? I mean, it probably put it put the idea in the zeitgeist of people to ask questions. You know? Yeah. That's weird that shows actually do do that, like saving, surviving R. Kelly. That's what got him arrested. I mean, everybody knew he it, was it, peeing it, on people. It, and like <laughs> fucking 20 years ago, he's peeing on little kids. But, you know, it, and now it gives people like, a, a, it, it's interesting. You see you yeah. see fictionalized forms of stuff that happened down there. The Narcos show as well is another thing, you know, see fictionalized things of mm -hmm. how some of these powerful cartel groups kind of originated themselves in fiction. And now that is in the public uh, kind of domain as far as collective knowledge. So people start asking questions. And some of these things, apparently people in power also ask questions as well. Jesus Christ. <coughs> it's just, uh, it's so strange how popular it's become. You know, and it, it's such a, uh, a popular focal point of fiction as well. And, and, and fashion. Yeah. You know, El Chapo's picture with uh, Sean Penn. Yeah. The shirt was uh -huh. like... Fire! Everybody Beautiful. wanted that shirt. You know that uh, Conor McGregor like wore something to mimic it when on purpose when okay. he was pro in the press conference for Rafael dos Anjos. Did you know that? Yeah, I, I he even heard something stood. About it. He stood in the same stance. Like, look at him! Look at him! <laughs> I mean, he's doing it on purpose. Yeah, that's, it, that's it's like a subtle nod to El Chapo. Yeah, I mean, he's a, he, he, El Chapo has achieved legendary <laughs> status. Now, For sure. Now his kid that uh, was freed by the the uh, the cartel down there, he was wearing uh, a scapulario, which is like a, you could I don't I don't know if you can see it in there. It's an interesting just a piece of a, a cultural thing from Mexico. Like what is going on in this video that we're so watching? So he just right handed here. the gun over he, his personal gun over to one of his uh, bodyguards that was not even it, these guys don't even care about him. This is a head 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 camera thing, and they're you know, putting everybody out there. And personally, I would put everybody in zip ties and on the ground. Personally, so these guys all have guns drawn, and there's people inside with guns drawn at them. And they're they realize getting... they realize who they have now. So they're like, uh, should we forcefully put him in cuffs? Should we not? So how do you know that they're realizing this right? Is it because of the Bec language? Uh, all the, of what these they're saying. I've went through a lot of the same training that they went through, and I did a lot of this type of stuff, and all of them would have been in zip ties on the ground. Look at this girl went, reached out and grabbed their guns and put their guns down. There's, there's, there's fear in these people. They realize that they messed up. Oh, Jesus. Right? So that's what you know. people question. And are, are they streaming this video live they, they, they have the, on their the, head cams? They have a head cam, and they're streaming it. Not Well, it's not, you know, they, 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 they have recording it, it, recording it, uh, and, and it gets sent back to the command post. So when he was moving around, he had one of these on. This is a, a, a scapulario, it's called. It's like a religious Catholic iconography thing. What right? is yours? What is it? Uh, this is a Santa Muerte one, right? It's like a holy death uh, effigy. And so he had that on. He had his was a Santo Niño de Tocha, which is like a uh, Catholic uh, uh, Christ baby saint they have. As soon as that picture of him went on online, they were sold out all throughout Sinaloa. Everybody <laughs> was wearing that. They have to work. You know, they work. Those <sighs> work. Because he got him free. Got him free. There he is. There he is. That's the, uh, that's the scapulario. Santo Niño de Tocha. Handsome guy. Yeah. That, that, that's an, also an interesting cultural thing uh, uh the the occult part of it where that's that santa niño that tocha shrine is right now it's probably most popular shrines in mexico or that one because they work and then you go to the holy death shrines down there as well and you, you see how how both sides both mexican government forces and the cartel they they both venerate kind of the same saints so it's that again that's a weird kind of uh thing they share that faith. What is that picture of his truck down there, Jamie? You have some wacky truck? No, it's just a regular truck. Uh, I, that's I, his. So, uh, yeah, that's one of oh, his. Oh, uh, riddled armor. with bullets. Uh, he gave out cars on Christmas. He uh, as a like he did this party to, to any uh, like townspeople where he was. How many cars did he give out? I have no idea. Like a lot of them. There's there's pictures of the uh, uh, El Chapo's son uh, gives out cars on Christmas, and there's a bunch of cars there. <laughs> You know, again, who 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 are you like? Who who are you right. gonna go towards him? Or, of course, or the government. You know, you give yeah. me a car, you don't give me anything. 
yeah, they they like you said, hearts and minds. They're really hearts, yeah. hearts and minds. And 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 uh you know, uh they they they, they pay for co- college education. So, so there's a whole generation of lawyers, a whole generation of doctors. They pay for immigration uh, uh procedures. So, hey, you want to, you know, yeah, I'll pay for your immigration, but you know, I'm going to call in some favors later on. Okay? Wow. So that that's, you know, that's that's how that's how you grow. It's full on mafia shit. Yeah, I mean they they learned. That, One that, day I'll come to you. Al Capone, <laughs> Al Capone, uh, you know Scarface, uh, you know all these things are kind of venerated by them. That's kind of their cultural backing. They have mm-hmm. pop cultural backing. Uh, they they kind of look to the mob era guys as influence or as inspiration. You see, you know, insane paintings of uh, the Godfather or or Scarface in some of these uh, safe houses where these people are right, and you're like, wow, okay. Or you see cartel influenced uh, series for Netflix, like uh, there's one called La Reina del Sur, which is about a, a female uh, a cartel head, um, and the 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 lady that that stars in that show was the one that took Sean Penn down there to meet El Chapo because El Chapo oh, was oh no El Chapo was a fan of that show. Right? Really, yeah. that's how it got going. When they finally caught up to him, he had the whole series on DVDs at his safe house, <laughs> which is pretty he, he humanized them a little bit. Oh my god, that that whole scene with Sean Penn going down there and writing a story for Rolling Stone was uber bizarre. Yeah, well, if if they get the the terrorist designation, he basically went down there to meet with the terrorist. What happens to him then? Is it uh, retroactive? I don't know. I don't know. But they he helped get him arrested in in a sense, right? Well, he basically th- that whole commotion put eyes on on the movements of El Chapo by the Mexican government. Why would El Chapo agree to do something like that? He was a fan of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that seems so crazy though. Doesn't it seem crazy that he was willing to take that kind of a risk? And take that, a photo with Sean Penn and that that actress. <laughs> well, um, what's, what's her name again? Cate C- uh, C- del Castillo. Yeah, right there. He yeah. was, Chapo was probably banging that, right? If I had to guess, there's rumors. There's rumors of uh, of, of of a meeting. That's about it. I don't know anything else. If uh, I had a guess, I would say yes. But it's just the whole thing. Look at Sean Penn smiling. Hey, here's my friend, the murderer. Well, I mean. Um, <laughs> I get the I, I I mean, I've I've heard some of the stuff uh, Sean Penn said, said about you know Chavez in Venezuela and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. How he's pro Chavez and stuff like that. And I have people friends of mine that live in Venezuela under that regime. So he's he's a pretty kooky guy. Uh, he has some pretty interesting ideas about. He can't possibly be that informed. I don't know. I mean, how you you really have to have boots on the ground to understand I what mean, the fuck you're talking about. I, I mean, you have to be there for. You know, if you want to know what's going on in Venezuela, there's so many different stories. My friend Abby Martin's been down there multiple times, and she gives me a, a story that's so different than anything that you're getting in mainstream news. And she goes there. Yeah. She goes there and talks to people. Yeah. Uh, spends time. Well, I have a there's a there's a resistance group that is based in the U.S. that works down there, and you know they put up videos all the time uh, of people picking up garbage and trying to recycle garbage to feed themselves in some places instagram immediately takes all those downs right really yeah why does instagram take those down i have a lot of that going on as well when i post something completely news related about something and 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 then get uh shadow banned or things just go down uh, depending on what i post up like weird things um posted up uh a uh a, a venezuelan people throwing rocks at this armored vehicle and one of them I think one of them got run, run over and that got taken down I didn't show the 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 part where he got run over but just the people protesting and why would that get taken down they got flagged as support for a hate group or something like that support for a hate group by yeah. showing the news yeah or showing a picture of cartel and again I don't post anything graphic on my feed because I don't want to get banned but I'm still shadow banned Right. So well, I, you showed that one, by the way, uh, Ed Manifesto. That's how you find it. Ed Manifesto. That's uh, that. Ed, that's Ed's page. Um, you posted that one where you you saw a guy getting abducted. Yeah. yeah. By fake cops. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and uh, did that well, one get pulled? 
Yeah, it did. Yeah, all of the all of the recent Sinaloa video ones are are all were all pulled off the, really? the Instagram account. That's why I had to re-upload them all. I just don't understand their logic. <coughs> I mean, uh, look, I can understand them um, saying caution. Some of these I- I- images and videos are sensitive, you know, like with some bloody things and S- things along those lines. Something changed in the algorithms a year back. Like when I was on your the first time I was on your show, I got uh, obviously I, I saw a spike. Thank you, by the way. Uh, but all of the uh, pro Second Amendment uh, pages and uh, people like there's a guy Crispy who was a yeah. veteran. You know, he yeah, no. also he, he got a lot. Of, he start, all of a sudden, all of us start seeing a lot of his stuff lagged. Yeah, his stuff got taken down. Yeah, he got. Then, I think he got a. Fo- there was a photo of him with Donald Trump that got taken down. Yeah, that I'm makes like, sense. Or I think it was Donald Trump Jr. Yeah, I'm like what the fuck is wrong with you people? Yeah, just because you don't align with someone politically, you can't take down photos and you can't pretend that he's posing with Hitler or something. Like, yeah, what the I fuck mean, is wrong with you? It's it's uh. It's the people can report things anonymously, I think. And yes. And if you hurt my feelings, there you go. So if there's enough people that flag your video and say this is hurtful or this is, they don't even look into it, they just pull it down. Yeah. So who do you think is doing Do you think it's the Mexican government that's doing that? Do you think it's the cartels that are doing that no, to your I, page? I, I think it's uh, mostly Americans that have sensibilities that are completely beyond my comprehension. That uh, see a gun in a, in a in a picture and they're afraid of the gun and it's a it's terrorism. They're supporting terrorism hate group. Let's report that picture or video. <sighs> well, I, I could understand how some of what you're reporting on, truthful as it may be, would be disturbing to people to find out yeah. that truth. But you gotta let people do that. I mean, I mean, what does Instagram want to do? I mean, do they want to put parameters on what kind of truth you're allowed to yeah. distribute? Per, 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 so. Uh, just to, for people to get some context, I, I do work for two two magazine companies, and I do do articles. So in that regard, I do provide news in, 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 in certain ways. Um, but when I post something on my page, it's a personal view of something. I purposefully don't go into graphic material because I don't want to get flagged. But sometimes there's always people with a certain affinity to when they see a gun in a post or where they see – an animal being butchered uh, for something like in, in, in a picture or when they see hunting related stuff or when they see some sort of, I remember posting up a picture of the make Tijuana great again hats that they were making down there. Red hats that said make Tijuana great again when the caravans went into TJ and people started protesting the caravans in TJ. That got flagged. What? <laughs> that is so crazy. Oh. Yeah, you know, if, if you want to confuse, uh, if you want to make people angry and confused, just wear one of those hats through the airport. Yeah, well, a lady got maced in the face for wearing one that said "Make Bitcoin Great Again." Yeah, some guy maced her in the face. Yeah, I saw knocked some, her hat off. I saw somebody walk down, uh, walk in an airport with a "Make Hentai Great Again" hat. Shh, make anything at, great again. You got, you can't do it. <laughs> You it's can't too make, close. Yeah, it's too close. I mean, you know, that, the hat, you know, red hat. It, I've never seen anything more divisive in this country. I mean, other than like a swastika or something like overtly disgusting. I I, uh, I started my immigration process when he got elected. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 been a trip. You know. I, How does that work? Like, if you are a Mexican-born citizen and you want to become a United States citizen, it, obviously it's very difficult. It, 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 so, married to an American, have an American kid. That's how I went through the process myself. And, uh, you know, I got a green card. Um, the the thing is that when he got elected, everybody said, you know what? Maybe our time to get a green card is going to be less and less, so let's all try and get one. Mm. So what would take normally six months took two years. Oh, right? wow. So in those two years, you can't leave the country. So if you but – what, what happens to people that are illegal? Over, that's what's fucked up about it, right? It's like there's people that came over here illegally 20, 30 years ago – and they've done no crimes, they've been an integral part of society, they've had great lives, but they they can't pay taxes, they can't vote, they have to live undercover. Yeah, it's I mean fuck they're, they're stupid. They're they're uh, you know they, and they do provide, you know, they do yes. provide. They pay taxes through other well, other through sales tax, yeah. buying things. But they're not paying taxes. They're not but if you made them citizens, you would make money. Yeah. Well, but, 
it's not a popular view. It's a stupid view. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's stupid that we have <laughs> these people and they're permanent illegals. Yeah. And they will be here until they die yeah. illegally. And we know they're here. Like, how about work with what you've got? Look, you've already do you doing your best to stop the border traffic? Great, fantastic. But listen, let's just forget about the past. These people are here. They're here and they're a part of our community. Like, how are you how are you going to deny them citizenship till the day they die and they're still here? Well. Legal immigration, just like I went through, is hard enough. Yeah, you got to find some American lady. <laughs> that shit's difficult. Uh, yeah, well, I, 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 <laughs> you I get lucky. it. You know? Yeah, I did. You know, and uh, I, you know, but it it was a hard process. Uh, it's a uh, it's 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 a difficult process. And you legally. speak fluent English. I yes, that's another thing. I yeah. saw people in the line with me. Uh, you know, that did not speak a lick of English. Mm. But they were from a country that had a quota. And oh, they're great, they're fine. Like yeah. Holland or some shit. They're from a yeah. country that has a quota, yeah. so they're great. But you're not. You're not. You're, it's you're, hard for Canadians, man. I have friends from Canada that have come over here to try to become citizens. Yeah. It's a fucking grind. Yeah, uh, and, and 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 don't get me wrong. I love this country. I, I've been. I'm new here, and I like what I see. I don't like where it's going in some places. What don't you like? Uh, I don't like uh, the. F uh, I mean, I left my country because I couldn't defend myself from the bad people out there. The Second Amendment. Second things. Amendment is. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. You have no idea how beautiful that thing is till you don't have an option to have it. That's one thing. Uh, I like the opportunities this country provides. I've had a lot of opportunities I would never get anywhere else. I like that you can actually work and work. You the work you put in matters here. Um, I like uh, I like how it's segmented and different. You go go to Tennessee, and you meet people out there, and they're great people. You know, there's some you know people have preconceived notions of what some part of the countries are, but I've loved it. And then you go to California, and you meet people that are on the same boat as I was, and they forgot completely what Mexico is, and they're completely bad. Americanized. Americanized, and they're completely against you as a new as a new person here. Really? Yeah. So you find that re like Americanized Mexicans or, or or like second third generation Mexicans the worst enemy of a Mexican is another Mexican. That's a classic. What? That's a classic uh, that's a classic Mexican saying and it's true. Most is that that's a classic Mexican saying. The, really? Most of the negativity negativity I got from being on your show the first time was from Latinos, specifically Mexican Latinos. What was the negativity? What was their criticism? Uh, when I talked about how Mexicans protested the caravans going through Tijuana and wrecking their city. That was viewed as an extreme to the right or conservative viewpoint, apparently. Yeah, but that was a fact. But yeah, the, apparently facts don't matter. Oh, that's so silly. But that's people. That's that's a good. That's a good example of people that are not there. Yeah, yeah. That are talking about it. You're not saying you didn't make a value judgment saying that those people coming through were protested by Mexicans and need to go back to wherever fucking rice paddy they come from. You didn't say any of that. No. So, so this is what I saw when I when I talked about it uh, because I experienced it. I wasn't. Uh, I was in TJ for a while when that was happening. Byron Caravan goes through. Obviously, a lot of those guys were. Gang members, a lot of them were, not all of them, a lot of them were, They're covered in tattoos. It's pretty hot outside, wearing all of them, wearing hoodies. Cameras came by. The females and the children were being put in front, parade in front of the media. To anybody who was there, you could see the circus that was going on. Mm. And then uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, camp encampments, they would, they would, you know, litter the encampments with needles on the outside. One of them was next to a school that had to be closed down. A niece of mine had a kid in there, and the school had to be closed down because it was next to one of these encampments. They would protest and close down lanes. Most people that live in TJ, uh, some of them are Americans, and they commute, so that's affecting their livelihood. You know, people that work on tourism in, in TJ, livelihood went down. So the fact that these people came in and disrupted all that whole thing, and then you would see these uh, Californian, you know, hippie American guys come down there and do puppet shows for these people, and hand over uh, donations in the form of canned food, blankets, and stuff like that. And then you would see these guys go to the back door and sell all that stuff in the back and just get money for whatever they were going to use the money for. We would laugh at it, but it also, you know, it's pretty disheartening. Having that point of view online, because I started posting some of this stuff online for people. This is what's happening. 
and that was like, no, 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 you're going against the, uh, the narrative. The narrative, yeah. The yeah. narrative and the and the people that are talking about you going against the narrative have really no idea. They don't care about the truth. That's what's crazy. Uh, the absolute is uh, thing. So if you're against the if you're against this caravan going through Tijuana and affecting your you're probably a Trump supporter. That's. That's, and I'm like, so I, simple. I can't even vote up here yet. You know, I have to be a full <laughs> citizen to vote so that it doesn't even factor in. on. on oh, God damn. It's so crazy. What else about America bothers you? <laughs> uh, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely this tendency in America that I see the youth in America. Like, I, uh, like um, I, have, I have a weird mental comparison of seeing my nephews down there. Playing soccer, um, going out and getting into trouble, uh, going to cockfights, which is probably pretty dangerous, but they go to cockfights, stuff like that. And I see kids up here on their tablet, you know. Playing games, playing video game, games. Uh, getting offended by something, you know. Down there, you can still punch somebody in the face if they get into your face in school. Up You're here, allowed to do that in school? I mean, you, you, there's, there's, you're going to be some issues, but it's fine, you know. You know there's, there's still that, you know. Up here, it's gone. All of that's gone. You're going to get into some issues. You're probably going to get out of school or something. You know, you see this weird... You know, Pussification of American children. Safe spaces. Yeah. You know, don't say that. That's politically incorrect. Pussification? I don't know. Yeah. What's a good word for it? What's the... Poli Come up with a politically correct word for that that has just as much kick, and I'll use that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they can't. It doesn't exist. It, it's the pussification. Yeah. I mean, and, and when I came up here, the, like the first year I was up here... Uh, I saw the California gun laws change. Like I got to see the weird California compliant rifles come to the range and you have to push a button to release the magazine. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And make it more difficult to reload. Yeah. So strange. Well, I mean, if, 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 uh, I've never seen a California compliant gun in the hands of a criminal myself. Right, so why are you, why are the good like the good citizens following the law? Yeah, the idea that you're just going <laughs> to handicap law-abiding citizens, and that's going to somehow or another save lives in mass shootings. <sighs> and yeah. here's the other thing about you, and I, I'm waiting for this to happen, but it's just not happening. They're never addressing people using psychotropic drugs. They're not. They don't address that. All those school shooters, all those mass shooters, are all on drugs. Yeah, they're all on some kind of psych drugs. And there's there's no mention of it whatsoever. Like what what is the action of these things? It's all about the guns. Yeah. And the guns are a, sh a huge issue. I mean, the fact that these people who they are fucked access. up, and, yeah, they, that they have access and they can get access to these guns and they can wind up shooting people. Yes, that is one issue. Security is another issue. There's another issue, and that's mental health. And that's the, that to me is the biggest one because without the mental health issue, you don't get mass shooters yeah, and, and that's a uh, interesting thing we t when i get people in conversations about the violence in mexico and pr pr uh, you know perspective mexico cartel guys you know go into a town and shoot up a bunch of people and it's pretty horrible uh but on the mexican side we only had one school shooting uh that like a notable one right and it was mentally ill kid when yeah. he took a gun to school right and our, uh, as Mexicans, we look at what happens in the U.S. in schools, and we're horrified by it. That's like completely, you know, horrific. Isn't that uh, amazing? It's in, um, again being on both sides. I'm just trying to figure things. What about pharmaceuticals being prescribed to children in Mexico? Is it similar? Not at all. Not, not at all. I mean, we, we're so behind in some in some instances as far as, you know, there's a, I didn't know about PTSD until I came up here, or or TBI, right? Really? Yeah, I didn't know anything about that. When did you learn about TBI? Uh, when I started talking about... We should say what that is. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injuries yeah. for people, like, I, I learned about it. kids. I learned about it from talking to most of my Marine friends that were coming back from... They're like, Head, like, what you're describing that you're feeling sounds like TBI. Really? Yeah. You should get yourself checked out. And then you go down there and it's like, ah, oh, you know, things would happen and people would get, you know, yeah, just drink, get a few days off, take a few... Shots of tequila, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Get back at it. <laughs> well, that's the old school mentality. I mean, that's what they had uh, to deal with in World War II and Vietnam. And yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, you've got. I mean, when it comes to that, but mental health down in Mexico, there's like, it's not, it's not anywhere as far as medicating it, kids, 
being diagnosed with things like autism. Autism is a thing that I only recently kind of heard about 15 years ago. In Mexico? In Mexico. And what about um, antipsychotic <coughs> drugs and all these different drugs that you're seeing that these a lot of these school shooters are taking? Yeah. In Mexico, it's not a thing. Uh, you know, people think that it's pretty permissive in Mexico. They can get any drug if you pay somebody off. The thing is that a lot of these uh, psychiatric level they're they're not they're not available down there or people there you can go to it and you're like what do you want no this this is not available here so it's not a part of the culture like it's it not is in America part, no no yeah in America it's such a huge part of the culture that people want that it, people are constantly wanting to take something to take the edge off or take something so they could feel better or take something to you know to just to, just to alter their state, and the doctor will prescribe it to them. Yeah. And then the pharmaceutical drug companies are just raking in the cash from it, so it just becomes a part of reality. Yeah. There, there, there was a few people, like, way back when I first started, you know, things were pretty lax when I got in. <laughs> uh, you know, they, you would get, you know, you're tested for cocaine and whatever. But uh, some people would go to Oaxaca and go on mushroom trips, like some of the veteran guys that would go through whatever. There's a there's a place in Oaxaca and, and Veracruz uh, where they go up into the hills and get some of those. But they call them veladas, which is like uh, basically going to midnight, and they would smoke these mushrooms and take them, and they would come back apparently fix some of them. That was like the story. You know, mm. uh, it was pretty good for them to work their things out. Well, John Hopkins is they're doing studies on on psilocybin, and there's been studies done on psilocybin with troops with PTSD. And that they, they've found that, that it does help them. MDMA is another one that MAPS is doing all these studies with MDMA and uh, troops coming back with PTSD. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of that stuff has been around for a long time mm -hmm. down there. Like, yeah. uh, like uh, remember the Beatles and members of the Doors went down there to yep. Maria Savina. Uh, and the well, they home. found out about it. was a Life magazine <laughs> article from the 1950s that was one of the first really mainstream. Jamie, see if you can find who wrote that. It was a Life article in the 50s. I'm trying to remember the, the guy's name, Wasserman? Wasserman. I feel like it's Wasserman, who was one of the very first guys to sort of mainstream psilocybin mushrooms, and it was because of uh, Mexican tribal cultures. Yeah. Maria Savina was like the, the, the figurehead of that movement. Uh, she was a lady that would do these mushroom trips to, 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 for people that would come up in the hillside with her. She would... Take her was own. it Gordon Wasson? Yes. Ah, it was close. Yeah. I knew it was something like that. Gordon Wasson. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So this was seeking the magic mushroom, and I believe this was uh, what year was this, Jamie? Mm, didn't have the actual year. It's, I think it's in the fifties. So, yeah, I typed in 1957. Yeah. So Maria, yeah, okay. Maria Savina go. left a whole legacy of that in Mexico, and she had a lot of people that learned from her, and a lot of these people are all over Mexico doing you know healing and spiritual work. Well, that's the other thing about Mexico. Mexico has some, uh, you have some freedom. Like my friend Ed, Ed Clay, he had a uh, Ibogaine uh, retreat down there where people would go to get off of pills. Yeah. Because it's one of the, Iboga is one of the best ways to get off of uh, particularly uh, opiates. Yeah. Um, there, there's, you know, there's, there's, Enforcement is hard in a country like Mexico, so you're not going to have people trying to go inspect things in right. some of these parts. So that's why there's a lot of places like that. You still, to this day, you can go to places like Oaxaca, where technically that's taking mushrooms is illegal, but they grow on the hillsides. It, didn't they kind of like uh, decriminalize a lot of different things down there? For personal use. So the quantities mm -hmm. now matter more than they used to. So uh -huh. sometimes you would get caught with a certain quantity of something. And that means you're selling it. So the, the how many uh, grams of mushrooms can you have? Uh, I, I, have I would have like to look to it up. But you know, everybody has a different p opinion on what personal yeah. use is. I mean, I remember the first <laughs> time I saw like a box, a box of them, and I'm like, what the hell are these? And you know, later on, I figured out what they were. And you know, they're, they're a thing. They're a thing in Mexico. There's they're a big thing in Mexico. Mm. Um, there's a lot of people grow them. They're a big a thing to anyone who finds out about them. Well, Once you eat them, they become a big thing. Yeah. Yeah, apparently, and they, they they use them in rituals and mm -hmm. all sorts of weird rituals down there, uh, as a as a doorway type uh, element. Like there's a there's a ritual where they do it where they bury you alive in a shallow grave. Oh Jesus! Yeah, it's pretty. It's basically a an isolation chamber, a really poor man's isolation chamber. Uh, they bury you alive in the shallow grave with a rope with a bell on it, and they give you a bunch of mushrooms so you can think about things in there. <laughs> 
<laughs> and if you freak out, you ring that bell and you and get pulled out. And they dig you out? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. How are you breathing down there? They got a tube or something? That's a shallow grave. It's just basically, you know, about that much dirt. There's a hole where the rub goes through, you're, so you're going to fine. Um, but it's a, it's like part of the death cult down there. They do that to kind of oh, initiate boy. people into it. But it's it's mushrooms. They they take mushrooms. There's a bunch of weird stuff that goes down down there as far as the, 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 the use of psychotropics like mushrooms and other things to uh, put people in, the, in that mindset of, you know, accepting a, a very specific deity or truth out there. Mm. Yeah. So w- let's get back to what's fucked up about America. I always like uh, talking to people that are that have come here from somewhere else and just sort of look at it with a fresh eye because obviously I'm, I've been here my whole life. I'm, I'm used to it. Yeah. And I'm third generation. Oh, you are? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm, my parents were second generation. My grandparents came over here. So it's all – I'm ingrained. You know, yeah. I'm in the system. I don't know. Yeah. I'm blind. <laughs> what else is fucked up about this place? Uh, I, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, when I travel around, I get to see different parts of America. And all of them, you know, there's, there's certain, certain places I've been called, ah, you're, you're, you're one of the good Mexicans, Ed. You know, you're one of the <laughs> good ones. I won't say what those parts of the country are, but I've gotten some of that, you know. Well, you, the United States is almost like Europe. Where, like, there's all these different countries, except they all speak the same language. Yeah. You know, like, Europe has France, and then they have Germany, and you go over there, and there's this one, and there's Sweden, and then it's all in this fucking big landmass. Yeah. But the United States' landmass is contiguous, and they all speak the same language. But if you want to tell me that Montana is the same as Florida, you're out of your fucking mind. <laughs> well, um, I, I take those comments in stride, you know? Uh, that you're me- one of the good Mexicans. I mean, r- being racist, kind of racial like that, and just messing with each other is the thing. Mexicans do that all the time, right? Uh, so I take it in stride. It's fascinating to me that people are second generation Mexicans up here take more offense to something like that uh, than than I would. Somebody say, "Hey, you're one of the good Mexicans." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. You know, it's it's, it's, it's to me, it's like a thing. I I take it in, well, in stride. Well, the easier things get, the more people get quickly offended. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. that's I a mean, fact. Yeah, uh, hard times produce uh, hard men. Hard, hard men. men produce soft times. Soft times produce weak men. Yeah. So when yeah. I, when I come up here, I see some you know softness in a lot of the society, and a lot of feelings get hurt. Uh, having to watch what I say as far as you know, I always tell people. Around. Yeah, I, I always tell this to people. First off, I'm from Mexico. I come from a Mexican education system. It's a third world country, so please take everything I say with that in mind, right? And then I go into whatever I'm going to say. <laughs> and so, like when you do, like when you teach classes, when I have stuff? a class, or I have a like, I, I recently did did a, uh, a conference <laughs> with a bunch of uh, uh, bodyguards and security professionals that work internationally. I had to start with that one just to not offend anybody, you know? That's hilarious. You're teaching. Security guards and bodyguards, and you have to worry about being offended. Every now and then you get somebody, you know what? You said something. Like, oh, Christ, you fucking babies. Yeah, so uh, never read the comment section. Never uh, never stay behind and talk to people, especially if they, they look like they're, they they want to speak to the manager, you know? Oh, do, do you get that yeah. when you teach classes? Every now and then I get some. What do they say to you? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, I think your point of view is, is 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 skewed because you work for the government down there and you weren't part of the, like the poor class. And I was like, I wasn't part of the poor class. If you work for like where I worked from, we were pretty poor, pretty poor, poor, right? It's not like you know, I was middle class. I was pretty poor. Uh, or or they or, or they try to tell me the realities of where I'm from. Oh, that must yeah. be hilarious. Oh, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, Ed. You're just fear mongering about Mexico. I go down to uh, Rosarito all the time with my family. It's fine. Well, Rosarito's fine. Go down to Tamaulipas where the shooting happened, and tell me the same thing. You know, it's perspective. They really say that to you. I, I can't imagine someone talking, particularly talking to someone like you, yeah, who's got like real world experience. There's there's people out there that kind of. You know, I, I I believe you. Yeah. I mean, I do. Be- people are so fucking dumb. I do believe you. Yeah. Comment section. Yeah. Oh, don't don't go in there, man. 
But it is really true that it's the the people that live the softest, easiest lives that are the most offended, and the people that have experienced like real hardship and seen real violence that are a little more hesitant to comment on things like that. Like, yeah, uh, that's that is possible. Yeah, that is real. Yeah, and it, and that's one of the other things that I really think is good about your page, and it really makes me angry that Instagram censors it. Is that you're giving real world perspective? You're you're showing real video of a lot of this stuff, and you put it up with with also your educated experience on what these people are actually yeah. involved in. Yeah, and and it's uh, I'm I'm not involved in any news agency. And a lot of this, like most of those videos came in through direct messenger oh. to my phone from people that were out there. Hey, mm. this is happening here. Like, okay. Mm. Can yeah. you talk about it? Okay, I'll talk about it. Um, like when the Mormon thing happened, uh, the, the people the people that reached out to me to talk about it were, were part of the family. It was oh, pretty wow. surreal. And it wasn't national news when I posted it up, Right. So there's some of the first um, like uh, social media posts about it that I could kind of I, I was trying to look for it and it was it wasn't anywhere, so I talked about it and like that n that evening it went national news, and but most of it is directly from having connections and people out there that still talk to me. So mm. I always keep my ear open to that type of stuff, specifically from that region because that's. That's my thing. That's where I came from. Well, there's not a lot of mainstream news that's dedicated to this crisis, dedicated to what's going on. It just it takes a big event like that to sort of break through all the noise and become a signal that reaches us over here. Yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, again, and things happen somewhere else, and now all the attention. Like most people are focused on Iran now. So yeah. the whole what happened down there. Yeah, it's just fucking crazy. Like I, <coughs> there, there's a giant problem right next door. You could walk to it. Literally. I mean, if you live in San Diego, it's a 15-minute drive. Yeah. You, like, it's right there. Well, it's just to, to me, it's uh, I love San Diego, and I love going down there. But every time I go down there, I'm like, you guys could walk to Mexico. Like, this is so crazy. Like, especially La Jolla. Yeah. Like, La Jolla, which is one of the most richest parts of the country. Fucking unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. Stunning views, gorgeous mansions. Everybody's driving a Mercedes. You're 15 minutes away from Tijuana. Yeah. And if you, we have heavy rains in Tijuana, all of our sewage is going to go right through there. Really? Yeah. Is that what happens? A lot of the sewage, like recently we had a major, major rain in Tijuana. All of the sewage goes across the border to the, to a Tijuana estuary. There's a there's a processing facility the U.S. has on this side, but it can't manage all of that, and they have to close all the beaches in the area. Oh, <laughs> wow. Which is again, it's fascinating how to see how the effect. There's a yeah. there's a border wall there, but there really isn't a border. There's wall. no border wall. You get in a boat, you yeah. row over there. <laughs> it takes three minutes. Or you can parkour. Okay. Yeah. I, posted, I recently posted up a bunch of videos of people parkouring over that wall. I saw it. Yeah. I mean, look, I admire ingenuity. I, I admire people that find solutions to problems. Yeah. I mean, watching that guy scale that goddamn wall like Batman. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's amazing. Yeah, they're they're coming up with weird ways. Like I saw some people do. Uh, Using powdered titanium to to melt the bars on 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 one of the slats. Powdered titanium. I, again, I had to research it. Basically, it's a it, powdered titanium burns at a very high rate, and when you start it, it's kind of hard to put it out. So they made wow. this hole on and this wall with powder ti some sort of powder titanium mix. That's like that shit. What was that shit that they were talking about with nine eleven, where all the conspiracy theorists thought that it melted steel? God damn it. A, a pi pi pirine or pirate. something. Pirate. Uh, Is that it? A, a tanner, something like that. I don't know. A word just popped in my head. I don't yeah. know if that's the one. Yeah. That, no, I feel like that's the stuff that you blow shit up with. Right yeah, now they sure. sell these things they call breech pens. Like, and they, there's, there's the, the, for tactical applications, there's these pens, that be sticks that you start and you can burn chains open and stuff like that with them. Really? Yeah. So wow. it's basically a ghetto version of that is what they're using, you know? In some of these places, I know. They, they, uh, I mean, the, the the wall as they're making it, and speaking to some of the border patrol agents that, that I that I know, it does its job at, as far as slowing people down. So they don't, so there's not an overflow of people coming. Yeah, through. it's not like yeah. Yeah. But what would happen if it was that? That's all my. Bonsai? Yeah. What would happen if everybody, if there was no border, everybody's like, Mexico's the United States. The United States is Mexico. Have a good time. Yeah, I, 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 that would be chaotic, of course. For how long, though? Ten years? I don't know. I how long? Think. I mean, once everybody got in. Yeah, that would be and bad. And then other people would go there. Yeah. I mean, if what if the United States and Mexico came to a deal and they said, yeah, listen, you know yeah. we'll call. wasn't there a thing that they were going to do 
there was a North American agreement. There was like they were trying to do that with the yeah. United States and set up a single currency. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a lot of conspiracy theories around the Amero. Yes, yeah. there was something like that. Like they were going to do it with Canada. We we're all going to become I one mean, nation. I could, see, I could see it with Canada. Yeah. yeah, but maybe not. You know, Mexico. Well, look. We could all <coughs> spread all the good around. Yeah. And then also, like, look, Mexico's got some awesome spots. Wouldn't it be great if U.S. industry moved in there? And, and lithium. Yes, and lithium. Yeah, Maybe li that's going to help. Lithium. Well, Colombia did a great job in eradicating all the, did. the problems with narcotics. I, I think it, it, it is really, well, not all of them, because they still have oh, a yeah, guerrilla, sure. guerrilla group down there that recently, kind of, uh, the FARC, that w went... Uh, Amnesty, and then they, they got active again. But there's still there's still a lot of cocaine being produced there. And oh, yeah. yeah. But, but it's not nothing like when Escobar... No, no. How, what did they do? Well, they were facing uh, just, just a few criminal groups, large ones, and Mexico is facing a, a lot of them. That's and interesting. they so have the U.S. right next door that is pumping uh, money into the uh, issue directly. They don't have to fly in. No. Yeah, it's not a so long it's a, plane flight. It's a short walk. Also, Mexico is a pretty big country. I think people kind of miss that also. It's a pretty big country. It's a pretty big country. Do you do you remember when there was a CIA drug plane that had like several tons of cocaine on it and it crashed because the Mexican government wouldn't let them land and refuel? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all sorts of conspiracy theories are around. Well, that was a real CIA drug plane that had been to Guantanamo Bay at least twice. Yeah. Like it was documented. Yeah. The, and they for whatever reason i mean i, I we're I, flying back with I, a lot of coke look I, at that <laughs> look at all that coke i imagine i imagine government groups everywhere have agents cowboys yeah yeah you have cowboys when people try to say the cia brings in drugs no no no. It's people who work for the cia realize they can make a shitload of money if they bring in drugs and they they pass that money around and they work it out but the cia itself does not bring in drugs yeah uh uh, customs, customs and Border Protection agent agents, and uh, just Homeland Security as an agency has the most corruption charges uh, as far as all law, law enforcement agencies. Do they really? Yeah, federal uh, federal charges for corruption uh, because they are on the border and there's a lot of money <laughs> on the border. Of course, that's that's course. why, right? It totally uh, makes sense. And uh, you know, I mean, it, maybe it was a CIA guy that said, you know, can make some money through here. That's well, I mean, probably. that was the whole Barry Seals thing, that Tom Cruise movie. Yeah. Made, was it called Made in America, I think? Yeah, Made in America. That was about bringing in drugs with the with cowboys that work for the CIA. Yeah. I, I mean, when I was working down there in Mexico, and I got to see different agencies that we would work with, all of a sudden we were like, hey, uh, can you guys just uh, go, like, look over there or just like, move over <laughs> there? Like, wh what's going on? And you would see like some sort of <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> like you, you don't know what's going on, you know. But plane uh, lands, plane takes off. Plane lands, nobody plane saw takes nothing. Off. Nobody saw nothing. You know, um, uh, money exchanges and just you know that's in you're just an agent. You know, it's just in the background. Well, that's the thing that's so scary about what's going on with the cartels is that the quantity of money is so extraordinary now yeah it's almost like they can do anything yeah i mean uh they have their own cell phone networks in some places what yeah there's, there's what's been, it called i that'd be good if i knew but there's kind of coverage they have they, they got pretty a good, good plan? Com pretty good coverage in their areas <laughs> i mean they, they 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 dismantled some cell phone networks uh in the past also like uh whole cities with uh, hidden cameras that are cartel controlled to see who goes in and out of the of the towns wow like so, they, so it's they, sophisticated. Oh yeah. So uh, Mexicans, Mexican government is working with uniformed uh, agents patrolling in pickup trucks in the back, and these guys are living in 2025 and using drones to 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 surveil the the patrols in the area, and they're using their own cell phone network so they don't have to be worried about government tapping into their communications. Uh, they're utilizing encrypted phone technology that is available now commercially throughout the world um, to get around some of these things, um, and and they're and they're working. They're constantly evolving in how they work. You know, I remember the first time I was working in in, in Baja, and all the cartel guys would would move around in suburbans dressed like federal agents, and they would look exactly like the legit federal agents, or <sighs> they were federal agents with the cartel guys. So you would. Uh, oh my God! So they'd be together. Yeah, and then we started working with the military, and the military didn't give a shit who you were. So they would stop everybody, shoot everybody, and the guys immediately saying, "Oh, now we're using taxi cabs to move around." 
and different types of cars and we're going to paint the, the the vans like uh, taxi vans or we're going to move around in, in ambulances. So they changed their tactics. So we were always after these convoys of suburbans and now they're doing something else. So that's how they evolve. They, they, they just, you know, you're trying to go after it with a hammer and these guys are mosquitoes. Right? Does it make you want to move to Canada? No, no. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> that's the furthest you can get away from all the chaos. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, but it must be going on up there as well, right? They, I, they yeah. must have a... So uh, I, I interviewed a, uh, a, uh, a smuggler, a coyote, uh, for one of the articles I wrote. And um, he um, you know, asked him directly, like, what do you think about the, the, the border wall and, and the immigration uh, uh, policies of this current administration? He says, oh, it's good for business. You know, it makes it seem like it's harder to put people in, in the United States. So, I mean, that wall is pretty hard. Like, how do you do it? I fly them to Canada and they walk down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talked about it before that the border of the United States is a wall to Mexico. The border from the United States to Canada is a giant clearing that's 100 yards wide. It's real clear. You can see it. Like It's almost like they make it easy. Hey, just go right here. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> a lot of people that want to get to, into the U.S. You hear you hear numbers from <clears throat> eight thousand dollars to fifteen thousand dollars, depending on who you are, what you're trying to do, how you're trying to get up here, as far as being smuggled up. And he's like, uh, pass Mexican passport, get a Mexican passport if you're Mexican. We'll get you a Mexican passport. Uh, we'll put two thousand dollars in an account somewhere. So if they want to verify if you're s s financially solvent, they will check that, and just fly to Canada. And just walk down, and that's what we do. Well, Canada's super liberal now too. With yeah. that Justin Trudeau guy, yeah. super liberal. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of their a lot of their business as far as smuggling people, that's how they do it right now. Instead of going through the desert, you know, there is that there is a lot of that going on now too. Like some, there's a lot of people from Africa, African migrants coming into in, into Mexico. A lot of people in the Middle East as well, which is worrying for some people uh, coming in through Mexico, trying to make their way up. Uh, but it's pretty hard for these people now because there's a lot of security now on both sides of the border, Mexican Guardia Nacional, and on this side of the border, things are kind of more stringent. A lot of the people that uh, claim asylum, like a lot of these my caravan members, come into the U.S., claim asylum, and say, okay, there's your number to wait, but you're going to wait in Mexico, so they get sent back. Oh. Even if they're not from Mexico, they have to wait in Mexico, which really? is pretty interesting. Yeah, There's a lot of these... Uh, immigrant uh, waiting encampments in places like Texas and even t in, even in Tijuana. There's places where people get cross asylum. Okay, here's your number. You have to wait in Mexico. They get sent back. Oh. Yeah. Man. Are you hopeful? Do you think this is going to work out okay? Uh, when you mean this, okay. Like, you mean this. This is what we're all talking about. Yeah. Is this going to become better a better situation in the future or is it going to get more and more crazy is the united uh, states going to become like mexico i think on a global scale we, we're, we're going to need each other before uh, before you know before too long you know you guys are going to need mexico and mexico's going to need you there's going to be some sort of situation we're going to have to come together probably you mean like a global war i don't know could be. Oh Jesus, Ed. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, why are you freaking there's, me out? There's a lot of Chinese influences in, 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 in industry in Mexico. Yes. As soon as Trump said we're gonna, when he, when Trump was going into into office, he said we're gonna bring jobs back. You know, this whole thing. So a lot of uh, factories, American factories and businesses, moved out of Mexico. And then the Chinese moved in. In a Instantly. second. Well, that's what's dumb about short sightedness, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, not understanding 4D, three-dimensional chess. You know, yeah. there's a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, and 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 you know, people can say whatever they want about the United States. Uh, American companies in Mexico are pretty good companies, and they're pretty good with their workers, and their their ethics are pretty good. A lot better than China. A lot better than China. You know, uh, and it's a it's a different it's a different game, and you know, it's it, it's. Again, you, you see the, the, these influences going into Mexico because they realize that Mexico is a valuable place for them to have influence in. Well, and especially with what you're talking about with lithium. <coughs> I, mean, with, I mean, with battery technology and green technology becoming in the forefront of yeah. American culture right now. I mean, everybody wants electric cars. All these manufacturers, Ford, Mercedes, they're all coming out with electric cars. Porsche's got an electric car now. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah, and they need uh, those batteries. 
Yeah, that's lithium. that's that's the next uh, you know that's the next oil the oil type uh, situation is going to be lithium, and that's right next door, All right? So I think uh, again, I think uh, as a second largest consumer of American uh, products in the world is Mexico, second largest. So economies are intertwined. We have a lot of Americans living down there. There's a lot of blood ties to in, in within the country. Of course, Americans don't want America to be Mexico. And, uh, of course, a lot of Mexicans want Mexico to be more like America. That's what would si fix things. Increasing the opportunities and, and making Mexico a better place. Yeah. We need to make some Make Mexico Great Again shirts. And, yeah, and get, <laughs> get in fights at the airport. <laughs> I, I mean, right really, now. if we're connected to Mexico, if Mexico was like Canada, where, you know, like... Canada is fucking wonderful. You go over there. There's amazing cities. It's it's great. It's safe. It's clean. If we can make Mexico like that, then we'd have, you know, it would be better for everybody, including Mexico, including the United States, everybody. Post 9-11 um, uh, at the border, you could see how businesses started failing in San Diego because it became harder to cross the border. Mm, so you, there's, a, there's, there's a symbiotic relationship yes. with some of these border towns, and specifically California is very dependent on some border towns in Mexico. Yeah, have you ever seen that documentary, <laughs> A Day Without Mexicans? <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. shut this whole fucking place down, man. There's nothing going on without Mexicans here. Yeah. That's why anti-Mexican racism is some of the dumbest racism in all of the United States, but particularly for California. Yeah. It's so stupid. Um, I'm, I, I uh, you know... I got to see how, like in places like uh, Fallbrook, California, where the, the the avocado capital of the world, they're cutting down all the avocado trees because there's a drought and there's nobody to pick them. Really? Yeah, there's less. No know, one to pick there's them. There's less people coming up, and it's harder to maintain. Like, a, you know, people, they hire illegals, and there's holy shit. Right? These farms need to organize. Start working on border control. <laughs> Like the whole—I don't know, man. I—I'm—I'm I, uh, I'm one of those people that believes in borders, but I also believe if you're a hardworking person who wants to do better, you should have an opportunity. And I—and I don't think a lot of people, particularly poor people that aren't are very well educated, there's not an opportunity. Yeah. They can't. There's no reason for them to be over here. So if they applied for United States <laughs> citizenship, well, there's well, why do you want to come here? Well, I want to come here for opportunity. Well, what do you have to offer? I'm, you know, I'm a hard worker. Well, yeah. there's a lot of hard workers. I mean, that's really the attitude. Yeah. You know, and I think we all just got, I mean, me, I got lucky. I got lucky my grandparents came here. That got lucky. That's yeah. all it is. It's just yeah. luck. And to deny that and to deny these other people this opportunity, there's just got to be a way to filter out bad people. Yeah. Maybe uh, as technology gets better and we can recognize bad people better. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I went through a bunch of questioning. Look at my background. I got a lot of questions for oh, what I used sure. to do, right? I got a looks, and it's fine, you know. And I, you know, I was like, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. So, like, I'm here. It's fine. But uh, you know, there's a lot of people. Like uh, again, Gar Gar the Luna Garcia Luna was here on a green card, and he got uh, nabbed when he went to process his full citizenship. So he was here for a long time. Wow. He should have just stuck with the green card. I would have kept quiet probably. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he's in jail, right? He, he lied to a, uh, to an immigration agent. That's one of the charges he has on him. Oh, wow. Right? So it's pretty interesting that people like him have spent a long time up here, things like open secrets and, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, again, not all not all Mexicans are good guys, you know? Not, not all, all Mexicans, humans not are all, good. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So... You know, hardworking people come up here. Like uh, some of the people that um, uh, that I've, I've met out here uh, that are kind of on the same boat as I am, uh, fresh in the country. You know, doing manual labor, construction, uh, working uh, Kentucky. I, I I met a bunch of guys that were working on the uh, Kentucky Derby or the horse stalls around them. All Mexicans. You can smell, you know, the tortillas. The good food is usually you can smell, you know, you can you know where they are. Dude, there's a place if you're hungry. There's a place I don't tell anybody the name because I don't want to fuck it up. Okay, there's I, a place down the street from here that like every time you go in there, Mexican soap operas playing. Nobody speaks English. The food's off the charts. That's how I know. Lengua tacos. Oh Woo! yeah, lengua more, quesadillas. Yeah, make Oregon meat great again. Yeah, that's another that's thing. What I'm I, talking about. Yeah, yeah. Or, Oregon more Oregon meat. Don't in the throw US. away the tongue. 
No. no. Don't <laughs> throw, throw away the out. tongue. The tripe? Yeah, that's tripe. Good. Yeah. Tripe. Well, dude, I love liver. I eat heart and liver. <coughs> that's another thing. weird thing. I see all the stuff you throw away from the animals. I know. Man. They've never had menudo. Oh, it's, that's that's sad. This place up here has menudo. Yes. Oh, it's off the charts. Yeah. Uh, be, be, best hangover food, uh, and menudo. menudo. Menudo, right. Why, how does that work? There's like a science behind that. Uh, you know, organ meat. I don't know. There's a lot of nutrients in it, basically. Uh, right. A lot of nutrients get stored in organ meat. And it's a soup, so you get the rehydration from that. Yeah, and yeah. It's, all, it's, it's like a common thing in Mexico about liver, specifically. Mm. Uh, I grew up on a, on a, pig, on a pig farm. And my mom would have this rule, if you killed it, you have to eat it. So I killed a rattlesnake once, and I was peeling it, and the liver of the rattlesnake was the, like a treat that she would give us, right? Really? Yeah. Raw? Raw. Woo! Yeah. It's That's pretty hardcore. Good. Well, it's, my mom was pretty hardcore. <laughs> my God, it sounds so. <laughs> yeah. But listen, man, thanks for coming here and dropping knowledge. We really appreciate you. And uh, again, Ed Manifesto is your Instagram page. Yeah, uh, Ed's Manifesto. Uh, Please, everybody, sign up. Go follow him. Check it out. Get yourself educated. Find out what's going on and tell Instagram to go fuck themselves. What they're doing is rude. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Appreciate awesome. you, man. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Oh.